And now Scotty McClue reads from the book about Father Jim McNally. Deliver us from evil. Will no one rid me of this troublesome priest? Had this remark not been made in 1160 by King Henry II of his then Archbishop of Canterbury and the future St. Thomas, it would most certainly have come from the lips of Archbishop John Heaney about his irksome and maverick but quite brilliant protege, Father Jim McNally. James Peter McNally was born in 1977 in the mining village of Caulfield in central Scotland. He was the youngest member of a family of nine, with a mother and father who were devout Roman Catholics, both of them born and bred in Caulfield from old mining families of Irish origin. Both of his parents, his father Peter and his mother Mary, had attended the same school and church where they had courted and married and brought up their children in the faith. His father Peter, having grown up in the village, had been well warned by his mother, as his own father had been killed in an accident in the mine, and he had carried him home in his arms, of the perils of getting in with the wrong crowd. He had attended the church boxing club, run by the priest at St. Thomas a Becket, Father Jerry Duggan. Peter McNally was preparing to box his way out of trouble and out of the village, hoping perhaps to play football for Celtic some day, when the army had come recruiting. Peter was impressed by the Land Rovers and armoured cars and by the smart appearance of the recruiting sergeant and the swaggering pitch and patter of all the members of the recruiting team, and he found himself very quickly fired up by the idea of escaping from a future where the pit was offering up its last, threatened with almost certain closure, general uncertainty and anxiety was acute, and the possibility of an entirely bleak life of penury almost a given. He immediately signed up, and at seventeen kissed goodbye to his young wife and childhood sweetheart, and his recently born child, and passed out of Caulfield and off to serve Her Majesty the Queen, becoming a career infantryman with the first Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders, where he was to spend the next fifteen years of his life. Peter saw service in places like Aden, serving in the company of his popular and highly respected commanding officer, who became something of a national hero, if perhaps less popular, with certain high-ranking members of Middle East Command at the time. A man whose actions had been responsible for saving lives, both of the Argyles and the indigenous civilian population of South Yemen, and whose name still commands respect in infantry regiments across the world to this very day. The ubiquitous one and only Lieutenant Colonel Colin Madmitch Mitchell. Peter McNally later served in Northern Ireland where the plights of all sides, including his part in them, and the incidents he had experienced, had had a profound effect upon him. When he was home on leave, Peter McNally would engage his children with tales of daring do from his time spent in the Argyles, that happy band of brothers, the exploits of Colonel Mitch and his distinguished brother officers, right down the chain of command, all of whom displayed such great leadership qualities. His own men, who reflected all this in spades by showing outstanding bravery, unquestioning discipline, and incredible self-restraint in the many difficult situations which arose on a daily basis as part of the many requirements of regimental life, while meeting the demands and often making the sacrifices of operating in this particular theatre of war, of which the eyes of the world were upon. His stories of how the colonel had them all extensively training in a gymnasium down south, with the heating turned right up, thus simulating the conditions they would encounter on their arrival in South Yemen. Peter told the wild-eyed weeans of the July night in Aden that the Argyles had re-entered the main town of Crater, with the pipes playing, the regimental charge, the pipe-tune Money Musk, and the Argyles B Company march, the Glenderool Highlanders, and they had retaken the town with remarkable ease. The establishment of Argyle law as there was no other apparent law, as the battalion returned to the town to good order and security. Peter also told them of the stushy it had caused in official political circles back home in the UK, but oh so loved and applauded by the British public at large to the extent that the Argyles were venerated in their hearts and minds for time immemorial. Listening to his father regaling the family wide-eyed and with the greatest intent, 
was his youngest son James, whose most outstanding and early memory of all this was as a toddler being taken to see his father on parade with his regiment and getting to stroke and pat Kruchen, the second little sturdy Shetland pony known throughout the world as the Argyle's famous regimental mascot for around 32 years. He later recalled how, even as a tiny one, how much the sense of occasion had stirred him, how much he responded to and enjoyed the sound of the pipes, the colourful spectacular of the ceremonial, coupled with the pride and excitement he had felt on the day. He also looked back fondly and with great interest at the reverential and respectful manner in which his father was treated by all the others both on parade and later in the contrast of the jocular atmosphere of the sergeant's mess afterwards, where he saw beautiful antique silver candlesticks, table centrepieces, ram's head snuff boxes, a drum that had been with the ninety third Southern and Highlanders, the forerunner of the regiment of Regiles, as they had formed the famous thin red line at the Battle of Balaclava in the Crimea in 1854, all beautifully and dramatically illustrated in the painting on the mess wall. None of this was lost on this observant, highly intelligent wee boy, and as it turned out was another early investment in his future. Having wished for a better education for himself, but having seen much of the world through the eyes of a Scottish soldier, where all lessons were hard learned and experienced though a great teacher, often asked a high price. Peter McNally decided that he wanted the best possible beginnings for his children, and he knew from all his experiences that he had broadened his thinking that the best was possible. If you played fair and played by the rules, if you played up and played the game and trusted in God and the CO, the best that could be provided from within the economical constraints and restraints of time and money that being a patriarch of a large Catholic family would allow and enable, not for him the endless nights of drunkenness, alcoholism, wife-beating, hot anger, debt with all the violence that accompanies it, and a hopelessness of which many households in that economically challenged area where there was great want and affected any members of the family who had often borne everything in solitude and silence. Of course there were bright spots. There was a feeling of camaraderie still extant from the town's mining roots. The boxing club, the bands and the general feeling of united we stand but with little official help bar that of the DWP and the church's most people who chose to stay or whose exit was blocked by ill health, age, poor education, genetic inheritance or just a general lack of confidence and a feeling of vulnerability which precludes them from setting foot in the outside world, probably failing to realise that in reality it was to many extents an extension of Caulfield and its body politic. With the help of God and his devoted wife Mary and the others in the family, with his acquired knowledge of service to Queen and Country, involving extensive travelling throughout the world, and with the help of the Church and his faith, Peter McNally ensured that a lot of time and resources were somehow found and were utilised and spent on the family of five girls and four boys. Although the others lacked for little, much of this gathered abundance was harvested, investment of time and love from the others centred upon the youngest, the bright wee boy, affectionately known as Urjim. Such was the rock from which J.P. was hewn. Like his father and mother before him, although he barely really saw our new Peter for the first fourteen years of his life, until he came out of the army at forty-two with the rank of sergeant, Jim grew up in Caulfield, and his most important years, the formative ones, were spent in and around the town and its environs, where he experienced, despite the political presence of the police, that the law of the jungle prevailed, along with the Darwinian theory of the survival of the fittest, and Jim was determined, even at that young age, to be a survivor. There weren't many toddler and child playgroup places in Caulfield then, and the social workers did not wield the power that they do now. Mary McNally took in washing, baby sat for her own and others, washed, fed, clothed, and entertained them all, read to them and told them stories, including those from the Bible, and gave generously of herself and her time. 
Jim went to St. Thomas's RC Primary, and again like father like son, Jim was incredibly sporty. He boxed incessantly, loved football and showed great promise as an athlete. In addition to attending Celtic games where possible with his father and uncles, he began to travel to all sorts of sporting events throughout Scotland as an under-15. He was also an altar boy at St. Tam's, as it was known locally, with an angelic Luke who took all his responsibilities seriously, but who also laughed easily with humour and who evoked a great sense of fun in others. By this age and stage, the church hierarchy were beginning to notice Jim's achievements, even taking an interest in his progress at diocesan level, and a decision was taken that Jim should go on to complete his schooling as a scholarship boy at the much vaunted and regarded as rather prestigious St. Aidan's College in the city. St. Aidan's was a fine Victorian building, with an academic pedigree to match. It was large and commodious, standing in its own grounds, and it had been built in the late 19th century, when the British Empire was at its height, some sixty years after the Catholic Emancipation Act of 1829, which had allowed Catholics to sponsor, buy and build in mainland Britain, and perhaps, most importantly of all, worship and get educated. It was here under the watchful eye of the Benedictine brothers that Jim flourished, taking all his subject studies in his stride and showing remarkable promise, agility and ability. He became a superb athlete and footballer. He was made captain of games. He also showed great promise in music and became an excellent musician, singing in the choir and developing a fine voice. He was often in demand for his guitar playing and folk singing. His great passion, however, was boxing. He was a born fighter. It seemed to be in him, and in his father and those before him. He often admitted, as he knocked seven bells out of his opponent, adhering strictly to the Marcus of Queensbury rules, that as he boxed he could feel God's very power working through him. Although this was not quite the route the school either primarily wanted or encouraged him to take, Jim was demonstrating to his elders and betters that he had a mind and a way of his own. He was a conscientious but independent thinker who didn't always run with the pack. He never bullied others and displayed a great sense of fairness, whether it was sharing out chocolate or buns or school dinners. Perhaps due to his background others came first and he had a totally selfless streak. Because of his build and athleticism, even then displaying natural if embryonic qualities of leadership, no one ever attempted to bully him and he became an instant hit with the other boys and the brothers because of his great sense of fun and the twinkle in his rather beautiful brown eyes. Individuality is not high on the priorities of a Catholic education, which is more a devotional exercise, but due to James's ticking of so many of the scholastic boxes and his prowess in the boxing ring and a number of other areas too, all this often seemed to go in the eyes of the brothers forgiven, forgotten, and apparently largely unnoticed. What did not go unnoticed, however, is that James McNally was also attracting the eyes of the young ladies, who thought he was drop-dead gorgeous and so hunky, and he found no shortage of dancing partners at the school discos and the church socials. It was made quite clear at this point that Jim was destined for the priesthood and for higher things, his future mapped out. But for the first time in his life, James was having a great time. He wanted to be a soldier like his father, but unlike his father, he had the chance of becoming an officer, and an application was immediately offered a three-year short service commission in the army, and left school for the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst, known as the RMA. After vigorous training, he obtained his PSC, he had passed Staff College, and passed out of college as a young lieutenant, and was delighted to be commissioned in the 1st Battalion Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders, Princes Louise's Argyles. Princess Louise had been the fourth daughter of Queen Victoria, who had married Lord Lorne, the Marquis of Lorne, and heir to the Dukedom of Argyle. Following various postings and trouble spots throughout the world, where the bulk of his time was spent dealing with refugees in transit, and looking after a great many lost, displaced, and 
much-troubled souls. He had been invited by senior officers to be involved in the administration of part of the Good Friday Agreement on 10th of April 1998, almost 21 years after his father had been in Northern Ireland under much more straitened and hardened conditions. James was as much in demand as a Catholic as he was as a soldier. He also spent a lot of his time dealing with the exploits of his men, both in sobriety and otherwise. In September 2000, with the offer of becoming a career soldier, Captain James McNally, MC, Army Boxing Champion and Crack Rifleman, decorated from an act of outstanding bravery in the field, where he had pulled eight of his men out of a bombing building, carrying out two himself, without fear or thought for his own personal safety, left the army filled with a sense of service and commitment, but with many more unanswered questions about his own life, both personally and professionally. He sought the advice of his old headmaster, the abbot, a genial but worldly and far-seeing Benedictine, whom he deeply respected, but in the end, like so many important issues in his life, made the decision entirely by himself, or at least it felt that way, to finally become a parish priest, following in the footsteps of Jesus Christ, the great and highest priest of all time, the wonderful counsellor, the mighty father, the prince of peace peace. <laughs> that much trumpeted but often elusive holy grail and the world's objective, apparently. Although he had come from the military, the function of the armed service was peace and peacekeeping. James had even studied for his degree in peace studies. The situation in Ireland, but a fleeting moment in the complex history of that often deeply troubled and challenging land and island, but also a place of ancients, a mysterious greenhouse of ideas and a cauldron of magical spells, and the melting pot of so many races, tribes and wonderful people, that being the land of the early priests and monks the home of St. Patrick. This all touched him, and he now wished to or felt called to devote his life to the service of God and others, and to tread in their footsteps as well as those of the Holy Master. His father, a lifelong smoker, finally succumbed to lung disease and passed on to the next world at the age of 55, just before his son's ordination to the priesthood. James, who had seen and faced death so many times, was devastated at his passing, and where prayers were offered for the soul of this poor sinner, he couldn't make sense of it all. His father was a hero and a saint to him, and if anyone should sit at the right hand of God, surely it was Peter McNally.